Good, e good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us for the second in our series of the Data OG webinars. Uh, tonight's webinar is on the role of the club coaching officer, and again, no more than last week, should be of great interest to the people who are on the call here tonight. Uh, the webinar has been presented by John Quinn, who is a GDA in Waterford, GA. He's currently in the Mid County. John has been working with us for a long number of years and has an even longer uh, experience involved in club boards and at county various different teams at county level as well. So John's uh, role as a coaching officer webinar presentation will take approximately 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, we have a number of questions that we've got in from people uh, when we were registering. And if you want to ask questions as John is going through the webinar, uh, his presentation, you can just go into the questions and answer section and uh, put in your question. And we will have time for some questions and some answers from John uh, at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, thanks very much for coming. And I'm going to hand over to John and John is going to take over from here. OK, John. Thanks very much, John. Uh, good evening, everyone. You're very welcome and thank you for joining me on what I hope will be a, a very informative session for you. Um, I suppose while this presentation is about the role of the coaching officer, I would hope that everyone kind of sees the benefit of to the club of having an active coaching officer. The position itself was first introduced, I suppose, about seven years ago. And uh, to my mind, it was an important step in helping clubs recognise the kind of importance of having somebody oversee coaching practices and structures in the club. Um, I suppose the fact that it's seven years on, a lot of people who would have maybe started out as coaching officer at the time may be gone out of the club. There's been changes in secretaries, chair people, etc. So we felt it's probably a good time to just um, kind of go back over what the role of the coaching officer is. Uh, so hopefully I'll be providing some guidance and clarity around the role tonight. So without any further delay, we'll get started on it. Um, as I once said, if you have any questions throughout it, just stick it into the question and answers and we'll go back to it at the end of the presentation. So the duties of the coaching officer, right? Um, as you can see, there's, there's quite a bit involved and this isn't to frighten people off from doing the job. And as we go through the presentation, you'll find that this is not all down to the club coaching officer. Um, he, is, he or she will need the support of the club and we look at the different structures that really should be put in place to help the coaching officer to really get the full benefit out of the role that he's <clears throat> or he or she is, is doing. OK, some of the roles that you see at the moment, they've already been done by secretaries and chairpersons at present. So what we do is we just go through quickly, just run through the duties of the coaching officer. This isn't an exhaustive list. There's probably other bits and pieces that should be there. But I think this will establish the, the foundation for it and the fundamental um, aspects of the role that should be done. So as I said, we will go through it fairly quickly here and then we look in a little bit more detail at each of the actions. So he needs to establish or she needs to establish a coaching committee in the club. Oversee the appointment of head coaches and assistant coaches for the year. Devise a club coaching plan develop and oversee an age-related coaching pathway. And as I said, we'll explain all of this as we in more detail. Uh, implement and monitor the club coaching plan. Implement a community of practice with all coaches. Implement best practice with regard to coach education and qualifications. Manage and distribute coaching resources. Implement effective club school link. Promote the GA Respect Initiative and li liaise with the GDA of your area regarding the various initiatives and supports that are available. OK, so as I said, you can see that there's quite a bit involved and no one really should be expected to do all, all this on their own. And we will examine who needs to assist the, the coach and officer with the various aspects. OK. So establish a club coaching committee. So the first thing I would say is um, this is really, really important for a club coaching officer and um, the amount of work that has to be undertaken to to really get the full benefits of it. It's it's essential that this committee is formed um, and with the club coaching officer as the chairperson of this committee, he should automatically sit on the club executive. OK, what we have here is I have the club coaching officer in the middle, then the people on the committee should be the club school liaison officer. 
the juvenile chairperson and secretary, children's officer, and some of the senior coaches. And again, it's down to the club really if they wouldn't like other people on it. Some clubs may feel that they should have a representative of each code and each age group. And if that's the, if that's the thinking in the club, that's fine. The only thing I would say about it is that the bigger the committee, sometimes the harder it is to get actions done because you can spend a lot of time on um, agreeing on stuff or disagreeing or whatever it is. So I would say kind of keep the, the committee to a reasonable working uh, size. But again, if you wanted the chairperson of the other club to sit in on it, by all means, invite them in. OK. Oversee the appointment of head coaches and assistant coaches for the year. OK, so when should that take place? Well, ideally it should be done at the end of the year, the current year or the beginning of the following year. OK, and this gives the, the coaches a little bit of time to get familiar with the roles of ho what age group they're dealing with, what structures they need to put in place. So it's something that really needs to be done early in the year. And again, you can see in the importance of having a coaching committee in place early. So how? Well, you're looking at retaining existing coaches. Um, we talk at times of the born out and the, the drop off of uh, children in clubs. There is a, an unbelievable turnover of mentors as well. OK, so it's to retain existing coaches, identify and head on suitable personnel and appoint coaches more suitable to the specific age groups. And again, that's important because we can have somebody working with, uh, say, the under 16s, for instance, and they might be far better suited to working with the under nines or eights. OK, and vice versa. You know, you could have somebody working in the nursery program who's finding it very hard to, to cope with um, the younger children whereas he might be an excellent coach with the older age groups. So it's just to, to bear that in mind when you're looking at the coaches. And who is involved in the process? Well, other members of the coaching committee along with the coaching officer. OK, um, a good idea I always feel here when you're looking at assigning coaches, if you like, or asking coaches to take over teams or to look after, after teams. A good idea is to ask the coaches at the start of the year to submit their top three preferences as to what teams they would like to work with. And then basically the coaching committee can sit down, assess where the best place to allocate them, and then obviously discussing it with the coaches. Because what you don't want to, to find is a situation where you have three or four very experienced coaches with one team and then a group of relatively inexperienced coaches with another. So we need to get the, we need to get the parallel right and we need to make sure that every team is being looked after properly. So it may be a case that somebody wants to, to three or four coaches get on well together and they want to go with the same group of players. But it might be a case of the club coaching officer kind of saying to him, look, lads, we need one of you very experienced coaches and we need you to drop down maybe an age group or go up an age group because the lads who are involved have, don't have the experience that you have and you can bring a lot to the table on that. OK, so it's important to, to bear that in mind when you are doing it. Devise a club coaching plan. And um, this is something that's thrown around fairly regularly in clubs. OK, we need a club coaching plan. And um, the question I would ask is, what is a club coaching plan? Because sometimes it, it gets a little bit confusing between what's a club coaching plan and what's an actual coaching pathway for the players. OK, so the club coaching plan in itself, it's a plan to create a coaching system which produces and supports the development of coaches and players. And that's very important to recognise that it's for the development of the coaches as well as the players, because as the coaches develop and become better coaches, it works in tandem obviously with the players. The players will get better as a result of the, the coaching. Yeah, so it's I think myself, there's, there's a, a lot of clubs out there who don't have a, an actual coaching plan. So I think it's important that it's one of the first things the coaching committee when they get together is to sit down and to look at it. So when you're devising a club coaching plan, who's involved in, in making that or who's involved in drawing up the coaching plan? Well, to start with, you have the coaching officer, members of the coaching committee, 
there should be members of the executive on it as well, because ultimately the coaching plan should encompass everything from the nursery programme right up to the adult. And the GDA also is available uh, in your local area. The GDA should be able to sit down and give you a hand with your club coaching plan if that's what you if that would you what you wish. OK, so, you know, use the, the resources that are there for you because the GDA will only be too happy to sit down and go through some of the aspects of it and maybe touch on points that, um, you know, weren't weren't thought of prior to that. OK. Um, how is it done? Well, I suppose identify long and short term goals. So, for instance, your short term goal may be something as um, getting a nursery program starting. OK, maybe you don't have one, but it's something that you recognize that it needs to be established. So that could be your short term goal. Long term goal, we want in four or five years time to have all of our teams from under 12 up to under 16 playing in the A division. And, you know, identify your goals, document them, put them down so that everyone is aware in the club of where exactly we're trying to get to. And one of the best ways to do that is to perform a SWOT analysis. So basically your SWOT analysis is what's the strengths of your club at the moment, of the coaching in your club? Where are the weaknesses? Where are, the, where are places that we can really improve as a club? And um, what opportunities exist for us to do that? OK, and then generally T is for threats. But I would kind of say there that what you're looking for is what's the constraints? OK, we, we a wall ball would be fantastic. Have we the money? Have we the fundraising capabilities to get a wall ball? But the only way you really kind of come to all these um, I suppose decisions is to sit down and actually do the analysis. It. And once you've done that, you just draw up an action plan then based on the SWOT analysis. What are our needs? What are we really going well at? And we need to keep doing that and maybe tweak it a little bit to be a little bit better. So I, I hope that kind of makes it a little bit clearer of what the actual coaching plan is. But again, it's um, it's an overall the overall context of developing your coaches and your players and what supports and what networks need to be there to improve that. So we look at a little bit of that now as we as we are going on. OK, so. Implement and monitor the club coaching plan so you can use an existing one club. A lot of clubs maybe have drawn up a, a coaching plan years ago. Um, I know a lot of clubs have done strategic reviews and um, from the whole club perspective. And maybe that's something they, they actually drew up at that time and it just kind of is lost to people at the moment. They might be sitting in a, a drawer somewhere. So, you know, find out about it. Is there an actual coaching plan there? And if there is, is there areas we can improve on? Or are we quite happy with it? Or do we new, need a new and exist a new plan? You know, start from scratch, sit down, coaching committee and draw it up. And um, like anything, you know, it has to be you have to be able to monitor and evaluate if this is working. So identify key milestone targets and who's responsible for the delivery of. And we'll have a look in a few minutes at some of the, the key milestones that you may have in your coaching plan. OK, so again, it's important who's responsible for the delivery and then the coaching committee are going to monitor, monitor and evaluate. What's going on? Is it is it working? Because if it's not working well, then we need to reevaluate the plan itself. Or is it that the plan is good? And just as a club, we have to put the resources into it that we need to put into it or we don't have sufficient personnel or maybe we have sufficient personnel, but they're not upskilled enough. So and that's an area then that you will have to look at to see if, if that's what has to be done. But it's really, really important that it's evaluated and at regular coaching meetings then it's come back and it's reported on and it can be hashed out and see where you go forward from there. So just looking at some of the milestones and um, the appointment of coaches, as we said at the start, you know, it's it's our early on. It's really important to try and get a plan in place as to where we're appointing coaches. OK, uh, the schedule of the coaching committee meetings. I suppose, look, that's that's easy enough to do. That's you. You pick a day and you say it's the last Friday of every month 
superpowers to last for you every two months, whatever the case may be, and make sure that, that that happens. If there's very little to be said at the meeting, that's fine. It can be over in five or ten minutes and people go home happy. If there's more something more serious and it's, the meeting is dragging on, and um, take a note of it and suggest a special meeting to deal with whatever the issue is. But I think it's important that the meeting takes place nonetheless. OK, and um, key coaching education opportunities. So are we looking at upskilling your coaches? What ed coach education opportunities are there? So there's constantly like, OK, we start with the basics of the foundation course and then there's award one, award two. But there's loads of workshops go on as well. Right. So there's national workshops. There's the, the Crow Park um, seminar every year. Uh, probably not sure if it's taking place this year, but like you have that the national coaching conference. Munster then run coaching conferences and they work the, their own workshops. We run them ourselves in the county. So there would be the Southeastern uh, Conference and then we would have individual workshops in the clubs. OK, and that's something that I would I, I would really encourage. Uh, clubs to uptake on it to if there is workshops in the club it shouldn't be just about um, the GDA going out and doing a coaching session for maybe the 12 year olds with one or two coaches there like it's far more beneficial if the GDA goes in and does an actual workshop on whatever that case may be it might be striking it might be defensive play whatever it doesn't really matter but to get as many coaches to the workshop and OK, they might learn a lot. Some of them, they might be feel that, that they know most of it, but you'll always pick up something like, I mean, I'm coaching 35 years and I go to workshops and you will still always pick up something that it just maybe didn't click with you prior to that. So make sure that the coach education opportunities are there and club coaching sessions, the schedule of them. So I suppose like anything um, with the amount of activity that goes on now in a club, if you're limited to one field or even two. In recent years, with the emergence, I suppose, of Camogie and ladies football, fields are coming under pressure as to having the time for all the different slots. So it's important that there's an actual schedule there and everyone knows what it is. And there's no mix and matching about that. You're not arriving at the field in no room to train. OK. And um, the equipment, again, it's up to the coaching officer to have a look at the equipment, see what's necessary, make sure everyone has it. The schedule of fixtures, games and blitzes. OK, and um, the Og, ourselves, we we'll run blitzes, we we'll run leagues. Borden and Og will obviously run tournaments and our uh, championships for the older age groups. And there's various blitzes go on. What I would say um, is that the coaching committee should have a look at each age group and see is the schedule of fixtures, is it enough for the actual age group that you're looking at? So does we say the under eight, getting under eights get enough games during the year? So if they don't, it's up to the club. The, the two things they can do, they can come to the show and they say, listen, look, we would like more activity for the under eights. And they show will look at that and see can we fit it in around the schedule. Or the club can just pick up the phone, ring another club or two or three other clubs and say, listen, lads, we're hosting a little blitz. Can you bring in your under 18 next Saturday? And then in two weeks time, we'll go out to ye and then we can go out to the third team and then we can go out to the fourth. So there's no real excuse for not having enough fixtures for kids. You know, it's what they come to the field for. They come to play games and that's where most of our learning will be will take place in the actual games. So just again, it's to make sure that there's a schedule of fixtures there that's catering for all the ages in the club. Develop and oversee an age related coaching pathway. OK, so this is sometimes this is where the confusion starts between what's a coaching plan and what's a coaching pathway. OK, as I said, the coaching plan when you look at some of the things we've touched on there, it's about ensuring fixtures and that and equipment and that. This is about um, what's the skill level appropriate to the age that you have. OK, so basically, what should your under eights be doing? What, what level of competency should they be at? Now, you know it yourself, that there's always going to be a, a, 
I suppose a variety here depending on the ability of the, the kids. Some kids will obviously be stronger than other kids, but there's a minimum requirement that really if you're on charge of the under nines or tens, what should they be accomplished in going on to the under 11s and 12s? So, you know, if it's a kind of case that the coach at the under 12s are looking at kids and saying, my God, I wasn't, I was hoping that all this would be done, that we, sh we should be moving on to more tactical awareness and team play. But here I am and I'm trying to get the basics of what way they're holding the hurley, or um, what way they're holding it soloing, what way they're trying to catch the ball. You know, if that's the case that you're having that mismatch, that they're coming out of a certain age group and they're not really um, competent in the basic skills, well, that's something then that you need to look at it. But that's where you can do this. You can identify this by having a co an age-related coaching pathway. And um, again, the GDA will help you draw up that. Or another area that you will find it if you, if you wanted a little bit of guidance on it, um, the Fundu pack, which was brought out years ago by the GEA, but it's still on their websites and that. If you go in that, into that, they will show you the skills and they'll be age an age alongside of it. So they might say on the rate, um, soloing or jab lifting or whatever the case may be. So it's a good way, again, if, you, if you're not sure of it, to have a look at that. As I said, some of the kids will be better, some will struggle, but it's a, it's a minimum requirement really at that age, okay? And I would say, no matter what the skill, try and get the kids always to be operating on both sides. All right. Whether it's football or hurling, um, at the end of the day, they learn it easier when they're young. Trying to teach um, boys or girls of 12 or 13 to start striking a ball off their weak side is difficult. It really is. And they're, they're conscious of the fact. Whereas at eight or nine, they're not really conscious of it. They just want to be able to do it. So. It's, um, it's definitely something that to, to bear in mind. Uh, engage with the relevant stakeholders. So make sure that the coach committee then talk to the, the various coaches or the parents or whatever, maybe the teachers in the school if they're doing a little bit of uh, training with the kids. Draw up the pathway and then really important, deliver the pathway to the coaches. There's no point in having the pathway drawn up and then it goes into the drawer and no one is really sure again of what it is. And this is where you can bring it to, and we'll see in a minute about a uh, community of practice with the coaches. This is where you can bring your pathway to the coaches and you can tweak it. You know, it's, it's not set in stone. As I said, it's a guidance more than anything else. OK, and um, monitor the coaching sessions. We, we touched on that to ensure that appropriate coaching is being adhered to. So look, we're all familiar with the, the, the situation where somebody new comes into the coaching and they're kind of they're struggling a little bit and they're left on their own. OK, so it's important there that the coaching officer with the assistance of this coaching committee and um, that they monitor just just go down, stand back, have a look at a coaching session and then say, OK, do we need to move on this? Is there something we need to do that's going to improve this coaching session? Have we like one ball between six kids doing a drill and you have four kids waiting? Uh, you know, maybe a minute or so for the ball to come back, which is a lot of time and it's a lot of time for kids to start messing and that. So it's important there that the coaching officer, the coaching committee are aware of what the coaching is like at each age group. And then, as it says here, it's reporting back to the coaching committee. That's if the coaching officer is doing this on his own. I think it's myself personally, I think it's too big a job for one person to be doing on their own. And it'd be more of a case that uh, delegating in the coaching committee to people who you wanted to do. And it, it might necessarily be somebody in the coach committee. It might be some of the, maybe one of the adult players or something, ask him to go down and have a look at what he thinks the coaching is like. And this is not, and it's not designed to be, and it shouldn't be a criticism of any coaches or uh, of the workload that they're doing or the type of work they're doing. All the coaches want to learn as well. They want to be the best as they can, and they'll be only quite happy to take on board um, a bit of help and a bit of assistance. OK. So implement community of practice with all coaches. Now, you might feel I'm going through this very fast and there's a lot to take in. Um, the actual presentation will be up on the YouTube, the Dish Oak YouTube. So you can, in your own time, you can sit down and 
um, copy it off and have a look at it. And again, if there'll be any questions, you can ask tonight. If we don't get around to them tonight or only after you look through the presentation in your own time, um, my number is there. It's, it's found that you can find it easily enough on the DA website. So just give me a shout or drop me an email, okay? So implement community of practice with all coaches. Sorry, I'm not going away, just taking some water. Um, arrange a regular meeting of coaches, both juvenile and adult, to share ideas and evaluate coaching practice. And that kind of speaks for itself, lads. There's a lot, a lot of knowledge in a, every club, you know, but sometimes we just don't get around to sharing it. And we don't really, um, we're, we're starting and we're finding our feet ourselves when all that information is already there and all that help is already there. <clears throat> and it's only a case of going and asking somebody. So again, I would kind of put that under the role of the coaching committee um, to implement a community practice whereby the coaches meet on a regular basis. And it doesn't have to be uh, a long talking shop. It can be a case that the under 20 coaches, who was last year's under 10 coaches, we'll just go and we'll have a chat with them and think, you know, is there anything you would have done different last year than you done? And generally you'll find that most coaches will say, yeah, I did, I did change one or two things looking back on it. And that gives you then, the person you're looking after the under 10s, that gives you a heads up and a good start. Implement best practice with regard to coach education and qualifications. Okay, so first thing I suppose to look at is to create an up-to-date database of all the qualifications of all your coaches. So how many foundation courses have we? How many award one courses have we coaches? Have we do we have any award two coaches? You know, what's their experience? You know, have they worked with the younger ages nursery program or have they just kind of did they maybe stop playing and go straight into the minor level or under 16 level? So again, it, it's handy to have all that down in front of you when you're allocating coaches and you're trying to because I mean, we all know it, clubs, clubs can struggle to get enough coaches to look after all the teams. So this is just another way of, of looking at what resources you do have and what's the best way you can manage them. Okay. Outside of the, the recruitment of coaches and that, what can you do? What's the best way to manage the resource that you already have? Um, ensure all coaches have the guard of vetting, safeguard one and the foundation course. And these are minimum requirements, lads. And the guard of vetting is it's um it's by law, so you, you have to have it. You shouldn't be in the field coaching kids if you don't have the guard of vetting. I'm sure you're you're all aware of this at this stage anyway. But <clears throat> again, it's it's good practice for the coaching committee to have this information at hand, and um, so that it's not. And I, I find that the secretaries like they have a lot of work to do in fairness to them. And like once fixtures start coming out, and hopefully we'll be back soon after COVID. And but when we do, and um, the secretaries are going to be overrun with the amount of fixtures that are going to be thrown at them because we're all going to try and get fixtures out for every age group and it's going to be probably in a squeezed time frame so the secretaries are going to have a lot of work to do as it stands so this is something where they can take a little bit of pressure off the secretary they'll have this at their and um, they'll have this at their own hand so they can say well okay there's somebody just five years ago six years ago since they done the safeguard one so we need to flag it and we need to tell this person that they need to do that again. Uh, there's somebody who has the guard of it but didn't do it electronically, so we need to flag it that they have to have that done. So little things like that. And it, it sets the, this, the tone as well that the coaches are aware that people are looking after their welfare as well. OK. And um, it's recommended really that a head coach should have an award one coaching course. OK, I know it's a little bit of a commitment. But at the end of the day, it's worth it's, it's certainly worthwhile to have it. And we really should have uh, an award one coach with every team, you know. If you can have two award ones, all the better again. But that that should be a milestone that the club is aiming for. One coach per team should have a first aid course completed. Again, I think that's essential. And um, you might say, what has that got to do with the actual coaching? I think it has a lot to do with it. It sends the message that you're an organised club, that you're a caring club, and that basically you're going to look after the players um, completely. 
So again, there is first aid courses out there if you wanted um, coaching in games or dish oak to arrange them, that can be done as well. Promote the attendance of workshops at county, uh, provi provincial and national level. We, ha we have found, like if we were to be honest to put our hand up, we have found that the attendance at a lot of workshops is fairly poor. Now, the reason for that, um, not 100% sure. If we if we knew the exact reason, we could fix it fairly easy. But it is something that maybe the clubs themselves, the secretary just gets in the, the notification and sends it out, and then people look at it and there's no follow up. Whereas again, the coaching committee could say, well, listen, lads, you know, there's um, a workshop on in two weeks' time. It's been delivered by a another, and it's really he's really good, and he's going to work on. Um, forward play, attacking play, creating space, creating awareness. And that way then, once you're going to the coaches directly, you can say to them, listen, that's, we really think this is something that would benefit our club. Try and get along to it, you know. Um, develop a community of practice, which we spoke about, and then record and circulate shared ideas. So if there is good ideas, don't keep them to yourself. They're not secrets. Um, record them. And as, as again, I said, look, I know this is the role of the coaching officer, but realistically, we see we see from slide one, the first thing the coaching officer needs to do is establish a coach committee. And again, the coaching officer can do this. He can record and circulate the or she can do it. Or maybe there's just somebody on the actual coaching committee that can be designated. This is your role. Make sure that we record any ideas that come out of the, the, the community of practice. And we make sure that all the quotes are circulated with it. And manage and distribute coaching resources. OK, so basically the club to purchase relevant coaching resources and the coaching officer to manage. So some clubs have what they call an equipment officer. So that may be the role that the coaching officer may take or maybe something that you leave with an equipment officer. But again, it's important that there's, there's inventory uh, taken there, that you know how many slitters you have, you know how many footballs you have, bibs, cones, etc. Um, like my own, it's just a personal opinion. I think if you have 20 kids, you should have 20 slitters. Um, you won't probably have that with the football, but certainly you should be aiming to have one between one football between two kids. OK, the more touches they get of the ball, the better they're going to become. So that's just something that if it's kind of a case uh, historically that coaches find that they don't really have enough equipment. That's something, again, that they should be able to go to the coaching committee and say, listen, we can't do the training we want to do and we can't generate the interest with the kids because we're operating on the base that we have two slitters between 10 kids and it's just not enough. So that kind of thing. And um, again, the coaching officer looks at our the equipment officer. Ensure that coaches are aware of resources and have access to them. No point in having them all locked up and the coaches arrive on a Saturday and they can't get at them either. So there needs to be, we make sure that they have access to the equipment. Um, ensure that the coaches have age relevant material. I, I don't know, maybe some of you have come across this. I've certainly come across it where you walk into a field <clears throat> and there's eight year olds training and coach throws in a, a size five slitter, you know. So like they're trying to strike this litter and it's not going a meter. So basically what happens then is everyone is gathered around it. There's a, a massive congestion. Players are not getting any advantage. So again, if it's an under six or seven, they should have first touch slitter. If it's a little bit older, eight and nine, they should have a, a, a quick touch and then you have the smart touch and then you have obviously move up to your size four and your size five slitters. So it should be age it should be age relevant what material they're using. And uh, same with bibs, lads. You know, you see kids sometimes and the bibs are so big on them. They're down below their knees and they can't even run without falling over. So they're little things, but they will make a difference to the choice development as you're going on. Um, check with the coach on a regular basis. And we, we've touched on this uh, quite a bit, but again, just to see that they're OK, that they have resources, have they manuals? Are they aware of the fundu pack? Are they aware of websites where they can get um, good resources and can work with that? And then encourage head coaches to use the resources to build their coaching sessions. You know, and like 
Um, I find it myself. You could do a session one night and it, you find it went really well. Document it. Put it down on a card. Hold on to it because that's something you'll revisit. If the session went really well, that's something you can revisit and it's something then that you'll just have in your back pocket that's not going out of your head the next time. Uh, implement effective club school link. OK, so basically make sure you have somebody who's going into the school. Club school leaders are after. They mightn't actually be, they mightn't be doing any coaching in the school. Brilliant if they can and, and they are. But one way or the other, there should be a connection there between the local school and the club. Even if it's only for the liaison officer to go in and uh, hand out notes or whatever, that there's training on or there's a match on or whatever. Um, meet the principal and the teacher responsible for the sport. Look, they're, they're always looking, principals are always looking for people to give a hand out, especially like if they were going to come in a month's goal match. Um, it's it's hard like to, to there's only maybe eleven or twelve kids going, so the teacher who's going with that class, like the rest of their kids are in some other class to spread around. So resources are tough. Uh, they they can't really the school can't really leave out a lot of people. So that's where the club should step in and say, well look, we'll try and provide somebody who's going to be witchy when you're going to play common and Moscow matches. Okay, uh, club notice board on the school premises. Again. It's kids, if they get used to that this is where the information is, they'll be there. OK, they will go and they'll look at that North board to see if there's matches coming up or there's blitzes coming up and they'll talk about it amongst themselves. And all of a sudden you could pick up an extra couple of players <coughs> because it's been talked about. Um, club coaches to offer curriculum time and after school coaching. So again, going through the matches or doing a little bit of after school coaching if the, the if the school have a field, that's brilliant if you can get into that. So that, that way the parents can come to collect their children an hour later. And um, once they know about it, they'll be grand. Don't bring them out if they haven't been notified because you'll upset parents fairly easy if they are there and the children don't want to go home, etc. etc. And then have club days, jersey days, etc. Okay, we're getting towards the end of it, lads. Um, promote the GA Respect Initiative. So most of you are probably fairly familiar with what the Give Respect, Get Respect Initiative is. It's out now um, about six years again, I would say six, seven years. So basically have a code of behaviour for players, parents, coaches and spectators. Now, maybe it's not the coaching committee that will draw this up, but it's certainly, certainly something they should be aware of. And it should be within the context of the coaching plan as well. Um, if you have a club referee, speak to players and coaches about the rules of the games. And sometimes if they know the rules, you don't have the amount of arguments that you get as well. So that's that's a good thing. And then just put up GA posts, just promoting the, in the, the initiative, promote respect initiative on the club websites and social media. So um, only one or two slides left. So what are the attributes of a club coaching officer? OK, they need to be Fairly good communicator. They need to be able to delegate, which is really important that they're, they're not overloading themselves. Organised, ability to monitor and evaluate, and knowledgeable. So it's not an awful lot, but it's certainly somebody who should be a little bit organised and realise that the, the role they're taking on is not just a role in name, that it's actually does a, a bit of work involved in it. There's a good bit of work, but Ultimately, it is really, really worth it. And then finally, just the player pathway. So basically, the philosophy of it is the, the child, we say from four to 11, they're just play to learn. That's all. They're just play to have fun. And um, the younger they are, the nursery, of course, it's just all about fun, developing their, their fundamental movement skills and their athletic development. And then you just have the early go games, seven to nine, and then the late go games, 10 to 11, with leagues and that. Then from 12 to 17, they're learning to compete. And I suppose all of this ties back into your coaching pathway, you know, that we're not at the age of seven to nine, be about winning. It's not. Kids love to win. But that's not what we're about. We're about making sure that a proper age-related development, skill development pathway and a child development is taking place 
as the pathway as part of the pathway. Uh, as I said, learning to compete between 12 and 17, where it gets serious. And then at the adult, it's you're basically competing to win. It's all about trying to win that title. And that's what it is. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, that concludes the presentation. So I'll take on if there's any questions there, you can uh, throw them into me. I have a few here that I jotted down that were sent in during the week. Yeah, I have a, um, I have a we will, thanks very much, John. And, and that's a, a really good presentation. Everyone who's here can see that there's a, a lot of role. And John made the point at the start how important this role is. And you can see from his presentation how, how we shared all the jobs that have to be done, how important it is. But again, like John said at the start, that it's, it's not a job that someone can do on their own, that they need to have their support committee or that in place. And, and, and uh, he went through a lot of the areas, the coaching plan, the coaching pathway, etc. A couple of questions, John, have come in here, and like you said, we have a few from people who registered. Um, yeah. First one here from from tonight. Um, would you move away from coaches, coach? Sorry, from parents coaching a son or daughter or his team up to a certain age group, or is it just a case of just a case of coaching them to coach the appropriate skill level? So I suppose maybe what is there an age group where maybe parents should stop? coaching their own children always a tricky subject i'm glad you're answering that one john yeah i, I think there's, there's two things to take on board here uh, number one a, a club might be in a position to that we say it's, it's tough on parents too so if a parent is coaching their own child it's easier for them because they're bringing the child to the field anyway okay and that's important and um, i think generally i have found historically and it's only my opinion when the children get to about 12, they're actually a little bit more reluctant to have the parent there. They're, they're, they're quite happy, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. But I find, and again, it's just my own um, opinion on it, I think the children benefit more when the parent is not there when they're at 11 and 12 years of age. Now, again, look, that mightn't be possible. And some of the kids, that mightn't be the case. But I think in general, they, they actually become more comfortable when the parent is not there. So I suppose short answers, I would say 11 to 12 upwards, I think you're better off if you can do it without the parent. But that's not to say, look, um, some parents are absolutely fantastic with their own kids. Sometimes the parent can be a little bit hard on their own kid. Um, they don't want to seem to be showing favoritism and they kind of maybe get a little bit too hard on the kid as well. So. It, it is a balancing act and um, unfortunately most clubs are in the situation where they have to and I, I really don't think there's any issue with it when you're talking about the younger age groups. Thanks John. Um, the next question probably deals with maybe three of the areas that you look at maybe the coaching plan, the coaching pathway and the coaching practice and the question is how do you deal with coaches who think they know it all already and refuse to engage so I suppose as the club coaching officer, if you're trying to put in place these coaching plans, pathways and practice, how do you deal with those coaches who, who may feel they know it all and, and don't want to engage or don't see the benefit of having uh, this work being done? Um, I, I think the, probably the best way to deal with it is to make sure that that coach is involved in the drawing up of the pathway and the, the, the development pathway and have them in the room with the other coaches where they can say to them, well, yeah, we did that. You've made some brilliant points but we don't agree with this part. So we think collectively we would be better off maybe changing that. We understand where you're coming from and your contribution has been fantastic, but, and you, you draw the line on it because one thing I would say about the coaching pathway or the coaching plan, if it's not um, inclusive and it's not bought into, you might as well just tear it up and throw it away. If, if people look at a coaching plan or a coaching pathway or a skill development pathway and every coach is at this, or not every coach, but a lot of coaches are there and they're of the opinion, I look, I, I do it my own way, whether, whatever it may be. Well, then, you know, the results are obvious. What's going to happen is you're not going to get the full benefit of it. Um, other coaches may think, well, look, we put a lot of work into this and this is what we wanted. And now it's just after fun, by the way, so we'd be better off not bother going here at all. So you could end up that losing more people than anything. But I think you engage that person and you, you draw on the knowledge because, look, no matter what a coach thinks or how good or bad they are, everyone has something to contribute. 
and that person could have some really excellent points to make as well. Thanks, John. Um, there's another question here which kind of relates to one of the ones we got in during the week, um, which is about how to develop more coaches in the club. And, and this one is, is, is partially related to it. How, how to get people to turn up to coaching committee meetings or uh, meetings about putting the club coaching plan or the community practice in general. So I suppose maybe in general about and maybe even developing from your last point about how to in, how the coach club coaching officer can get more engagement from the coaches that are already there and maybe to develop more coaches in the club from the, the, the existing pool of club members or parents or players. Yeah, um, I think sometimes we, we have to be conscious of the fact that coaches in general are putting a fair bit of time into the club as well, right? And they're, they are giving up their own free time to go down to the field maybe two or three times a week and maybe the weekend. So it's not always possible and to get them around the table. And sometimes the coach may feel, well, look, I'm doing enough as it is. So maybe it's a kind of case that the coaching officer or member of the committee could take the time out to talk to him and, um, you know, after the coaching session some night and just say, look, you know, we're, we're conscious of the fact that you're putting a lot of time in and you're busy and you're doing shift work or you're doing farming or whatever, and you're not always available. But we do think that your input is necessary. So we have just a couple of questions that we want to go through with you and we can bring it back to the coach committee so that the input is there from you as well. Um, and I hope I'm not sounding too political here and trying to, you know, push it to one side or anything. But, you know, I suppose we do have to be cognizant of the fact that some people just won't have the time or they're just not people who like to sit down and engage at a meeting, consider a meeting worth the time. <coughs> Excuse me, a waste of time. But we do need at the same time, we do need to get their um, their opinions on it. Bad, good or indifferent, then there may be something there to, to, to pull out of it, you know. Lovely. And, and maybe just... John, to follow on from that one, when we got in during the week, um, regarding current club players, and often players kind of wait till they're finished at, at, at playing hurling football, Camogie Ladies football before they get involved. But any any, any thoughts or any, any approaches you might have for getting the current players to assist with the coaching? And I suppose this is from the point of view that the current adult players might be seen as the, the I suppose, the the idols are might be good role models for the younger players and any ways or any anything you, you can share with us on how to get some of them involved in the coaching on a even on a, a somewhat irregular basis down in the juvenile end yeah i, I think there's there's probably a couple of ways and um, one of the ways i think is a good idea is is to get the, the adult manager the senior manager to allocate um four or five players to a, a team okay and basically what you're doing there is you, there's no pressure on um, players to give a big commitment of their time. Because in fairness to them, like, you know, if you take, um, just for instance, take Callum Lines in Valley Duffloa, right, who is now an inter-county hurler and he's a nomination for an All-Star. Like, every child and every team will want to see Callum Lines in the field. That's that's what they want. And with the best will in the world, his, his own training schedule and his own personal life and everything, it's not going to allow them to do that. So I would say if if possible, maybe to group, um, if you could get the senior manager to group players and say, listen, that's one of the five of you. Um, you need to be in the field this Saturday morning for an hour, an hour and a half. Make it up amongst yourselves. But we want one of you there and it's your responsibility. And if there's a kind of case that we're only getting to the field once every three weeks between the five of them, it's really a very little commitment but it's a good impact, you know, and the kids will appreciate that very much. Um, I think one of the areas we probably don't work on enough is we have a lot, like every club has minor hurlers and footballers, okay? The is a 17, 16 years of age. We're doing nothing on a Saturday morning, okay? Half the time they're down in the field anyway, poking the ball around. And like, if you could allocate some of these lads with an adult, every one of them will be able to show a young fella how to hold a hurley or kick a football or catch a ball or do a little bit of solo on. It's it's no big deal to them. They're all hurling away or they're all playing football and it's um, the kids get a good kick out of them and you'd be surprised. I've seen it with the TY courses that we've ran over the years. Um, you know, what we do is when, when it allows, we bring the TY students into the primary school and they would organise a little blitz. They would take the 30 young fellas or whatever, split them into teams, put the bibs on them, manage them, put on their helmets, show them the whole 
properties and basically manage the team, right? And the, the reaction is phenomenal. The, the young fellas themselves, the 16, 17 year olds, they really get involved and the kids get a great kick out of it. So that's an area I think that um, clubs probably neglect when they're looking at looking for courts and that. Because these lads, they do have the time because most of these lads now who are, um, who are serious about their game, like it's, it's not that they're out um, drinking or eating in the night times. They're there, they're fresh, they're fit. They're, they're looking to keep involved. And so like, it's, it's an easy enough guarantee if you said it to them lads, you know, you're up there poking the ball, come down and give me a hand. There won't be an issue with it, you know. Lovely, thanks. Um, a couple more, some of the ones we've got in, you've kind of, during the week, you've yep. kind of covered in some of these about the, 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 I suppose, the attributes and the qualifications. One here, um, would it be a good idea for a club to have a director hurling or football um, for want of a better way of phrase of it, for the juvenile sections, or would you see, or, or maybe to add to that question, would you see that as the role of the club coaching officer, or do you think it's a, a separate um, uh, job for somebody in, in the club, John? Yeah, I think um, a director of hurling is, is a, I suppose it's a title that came out a while ago, whether you call it directing or director of hurling or um, a coaching officer or whatever, it doesn't really matter. But yes, there, I think there should be somebody there. And um, that person, I think it's also important that um, the role is clearly defined, you know, what exactly is expected of that person. So what's the terms of reference from the job he's going to do? And I think that it's important that that person, whether it be a hurling or director of hurling for juvenile level, that person should sit on the coaching committee as well. OK, it's important that that input is there. And um, I suppose just a little word of caution. It's important that you get the right person. It's like any job. It's like the, whether it be the secretary, the PRO, the treasurer, it's important that a little bit of thought is put into the, the person that's, <coughs> excuse me, and um, that's nominated. That it's not just, he's not just um, uh, appointed to it on the basis that he was a brilliant hurler 15 years ago and he'd make a good director of hurling, you know. So I, I think it's yes, I think it's important and I think it's a good, a good person to have, but it's just put in a good bit of thought into who, um, is going to be approached and make sure then that um, they're happy with it before it's appointed. Yeah. Lovely, thanks for that. Um, we we'll just go through one or two more. And it's very it, tonight and, and you know, with people from not just the uh, GA, Camogie, Ladies Football and Waterford, with people from a number of clubs across the country nearly at this stage, which is, is great. And hopefully these people will get some stuff that they can bring back to their own counties. Um, just a question here, and you, you, you kind of touched on this, John, about the, the coaching plan. Um, would you have a need to have the plan in place for all age groups in, in year one? Is that, a, is that a, a, a critical thing for year one as, as someone's role as a coaching officer or is that something that might come in place over a, a, a maybe slightly longer period of time? Um, sorry, are we talking about the, the, the coaching plan? Co or coaching plan, sorry, yeah. Would you need to have happen. a plan for all age groups up to adult level in the first year? Or would it be something that might maybe to, is that something that you might see might might come in place over a couple of years to have that club coaching plan in place? Yeah, so you're talking really about the coaching pathway for each age group. Yeah, the pathway. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I would think. Look, it, it's not necessary. I think if you can get it all in the one year, and um, you know, if you have the time to do it, but I wouldn't rush it through. As I said, it's something that you know to put a bit of thought into it, and um, sit down with the, the maybe the senior coaches in the club even though they'd only be operating with the with maybe the adult teams, that's fine because ultimately that's where you're trying to get the player to. OK, but if you found yourself under pressure, I think just just categorize it. Maybe say, well, look, we're going to get the nursery on the seven, on the eight, on the nine, on the ten, on the eleven, up to early goal games. We're going to have um, the skill development pathway for these. OK, and we're going to implement this and make sure we get it right. Because them 11, that 11 year age group are going to move on to under 12 next year. So we do need to have the plan in place next year for that group of players to move on to. OK, so I hope I am explaining myself right uh, where I'm coming from on that. It doesn't necessarily have to be all done in the one year, but certainly categorize a certain section of it and make sure that that's done well. If you feel that you're, you're going to be under pressure to get it done, don't don't just um, fob it and throw it in on the basis that we run there at a time, you know. Lovely, that's great. Two more very quick ones, Jen, John, I think we're coming towards the end of it. Um, do you have an example of a coaching SWAT with 
real type information that could be shared with people, not necessarily obviously naming clubs, but maybe an example or a sample of something you might have put together with some of your clubs that could be shared with, with some of the things that might come out of it. It's a question that, that has come up here. Um, I, I don't actually, um, I suppose, I, I could give a template of the SWOT analysis. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what we're looking um, at. Yeah, I think that's what we're looking at. But really what you're at. talking about, I think this is this is really important that it's identified that the actual issues and the strengths in that are identified by the club itself. Because <clears throat> every club is going to be different in terms of what their strengths are, what their weaknesses. So if you take, we say, a club like um, Ballygon or Abbey side, right, they have huge strength in, in the numbers available to them and maybe the amount of coaches available to them. Whereas um, a club, we say, from a small rural area somewhere, like that is going to not be a strength for them. That is going to be a weakness and it's going to be something that they have to explore and that they have to <coughs> identify. So I think myself, it's to maybe two or three points that the club look at and think, OK, what are we doing well? What's working for us? And we would be really kind of happy just to continue doing what we're doing with it. OK, and if you can kind of pick just two or three points, not to get old, not to overload yourself and work on them two or three and then move on to the next. Again, like the opportunities in some clubs, we say, um, right, we have a school down the road from us that we're not engaged in, um, but they've good numbers. They have good numbers in their junior infant, senior infants and first class. Well, look, there's an opportunity for this club that we can actually get in there now and we can benefit majorly from that. Whereas another club maybe have a very good school uh, relationship and it's not something that they would be putting down as an opportunity. They'd be putting it down as one of our strengths. So, you know, from that perspective, it's hard to actually put in the, the specifics. But the template is it's fairly standard and uh, I suppose even in businesses just to, to look at it's, it's basically just across and you have four boxes and you have strengths, uh, weaknesses, opportunities. And as I said, I, I kind of go with constraints rather than threats. It's just um, what's what's in our way of doing this. You know? Perfect. And I suppose the, the very last one, John, I suppose um, but if you were to give someone one piece of advice um, for a, a new coaching officer starting off now at, in, in 2021, what's maybe the one thing you would say to them that they, they to, to get themselves up and running and to get themselves uh, started, that, that one piece of advice for a, a new coaching officer starting off? I think the, 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 the main piece of advice I would good, give is make sure you get a good coaching committee in place and they will provide the necessary support and backup to you. If you don't get that committee in place, Everything else after that is going to be it's going to be hard work, and it's you know, you're going to find yourself a little bit swamped, um, to try and get everything that we spoke about. And I'm not saying you're going to get all of that done anyway, right? There is a you can see from the slides there's a fair bit of work involved in getting it up and running properly. But I think that is the, the key to it is to make sure that you have a good coaching committee in place that are hard working, knowledgeable. And they'll all bring something to the table. Yeah, so that that would be my advice. Lovely. Thanks very much, John. And and I suppose we're 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 coming to about five past eight. Um, that we're coming more or less to the conclusion. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming on to the the webinar tonight. Hopefully, people will have got um good information and good good stuff from it. As John said, his details there are on the presentation. Um, the as we said to you at the start, this is being recorded, so we will be sending a link to this webinar to people during the week and um, so people can view it again in their own time um, and they might as John said they might pick up a few more things that they might have a couple of questions or queries on and, and feel free to contact John at any stage or any of the games development staff here in Watford or for those people outside of Watford uh, the, the games development staff in your own county who, who will be doing a similar role to, to our staff here um, you can see John has put a lot of work into that so thanks very much for that John and just to let people know that the next in our in our webinar series is in two weeks from tonight. So that's Monday, the 1st of March, um, and that's with Peter Nash. And that's on the team, the youth players, the youth coach developing the players through the teenage years. And again, the link for that, for those of you who'd like to go on to that, will be uh, sent out to people during the week. But again, thanks, everybody, for, for coming on board. Thanks, John, for all the work you did and, and for presenting tonight. And other than to uh, wish everyone a, a good evening and to uh, keep safe and, and 
hopefully we'll be back on the in the field in the not too distant future. And um, thank everybody for uh, tuning in this evening. For Margaret, Hi, everyone. Thank you.